Okay, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I, this is this is joint work that's been in progress for, I guess, uh, between one and two years now. Um, so it's joint with a lot of people: Tom Braden at UMass, Jun He, who's who's here, Nick Proudfoot, who's at Oregon, and Bo Tong Wong, who's at Wisconsin Madison. So I, I don't consider myself an algebraic geometer, so uh, there may be questions that you ask that I, I just don't know. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll try to explain everything that I'm doing. So the first part of the talk is going to be uh, ba basically like a lightning review of the left-hand column. Okay, so if you haven't seen the left-hand column before, that's perfectly fine. You can ignore the first five or ten minutes of the talk. It's just that if you've seen this column before, then you'll be able to see analogies when I start on this side. And this side I'll start from scratch. Okay? So let's start with a review of the left hand side. Okay. So Kajdan Lustig theory for Coxer groups. So the, the KL up there stands for Kajdan Lustig. OK, so what happens here is I start with a Coxeter group. And two things that a Coxeter group comes equipped, equipped with is a Bruja poset. So some po poset. And this poset has a rank function. So you can ask what the length of a word is in the Coxeter group. Okay, So out of this information, so Kajdan Lustig in 1979 said that if I take two elements of this Coxeter group, then I can associate two with a polynomial. All right? So there exists a unique polynomial. I'll call it P, Y, W, T. And this polynomial has integer coefficients. And here are some things about it. So first of all, it has some recursive definition. Okay, so it's defined recursively. recursively. Using some simpler polynomials called R polynomials. Again, again, if this is all strange to you, after the first section, I'll start from scratch. And the second thing that I want to say is that these polynomials are, OK, so they carry a lot of important information. But as polynomials, they're not special. OK? So I'll, before someone throws tomatoes at me, I'll explain what I mean. So not special means that there's a theorem by, by Polo that says most polynomials are kajdan lusik polynomials. OK? So here's what I mean. So let's see. There's a theorem by Polo in 1999 that says every polynomial uh, that has non-negative coefficients and constant term 1 is already a kajdan lustig polynomial, even for the symmetric group. for some symmetric group. OK? So this is what I mean. Most polynomials are kajdan lusik polynomials. OK, so the next thing I want to say so about, about the left-hand side here is that, well, these, these polynomials are defined in terms of some na nasty recursion. And all you need is two elements of the, of the Coxeter group. What do you mean by R polynomials? Uh, so I won't de define this. As I said, uh, I'm just going to review this very quickly. If you know what this, this side is, it's a review. Uh, so it's just a polynomial whose name is R. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes, yes. It's a polynomial whose name is R. <laughs> correct. <laughs> OK, and when I, when I do this, I'll, I'll define what the R polynomial is in this case. For those of us who don't know what polynomials are, are you going to say like, what the point of these 
Yeah, and, and the next theorem is going to be like what they are geometrically. Yes. So, right, the next theorem is that um, this, is, this is the next year after they were defined by the same people. So it says that, well, if I start with a, with a vial group of a semi-simple Lie algebra, so not, not just a Coxeter group, but a special case. OK, so for vial groups, I have geometry. So I, I can define a flag variety. And then there are closed subvarieties of the flag variety called Schubert varieties. OK? And it turns out these, these cosmic lustig polynomials have some interpretation in terms of Schubert varieties. So here's what it is. Can I have something else? Yeah. So in this inverse theorem by Paolo, you say for polynomials with non-negative coefficients. Yeah. Is it known that these cosmic lustig things have <laughs> non-negative coefficients? Yes, I'm getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All things in time, yes. OK. <laughs> here's, here's the theorem. <laughs> OK. So this kajan lustig polynomial, when I'm, when I'm in the special case of a vial group, it's some intersection cohomology Poincaré polynomial. OK, so it's the dimension of the intersection cohomology of some Schubert variety. And it's a local intersection cohomology Poincaré polynomial, so I have to take a stock and another one. So it's this guy. All right, so all I'm saying is that the coefficients of these kajan lustig polynomials have some interpretation in terms of intersection cohomology of something. OK? So in particular, when we're, when we're in this situation, since they're dimensions of something, the coefficients are not negative. All right? So that was the story for a long time, at least the part of the story that I, that I just told. But see, these polynomials, again, I mean, I use geometry to show that the, the coefficients were not negative. But you can still define these polynomials for arbitrary Coxeter groups. Okay? So, and for arbitrary Coxeter groups, you sort of don't have a flag variety floating around. So you can't make this kind of theorem. But, So there's a theorem by Elias and Williamson in 2014, so 34 years later, that says that if your W is a Coxeter group, then the kajlan lustig polynomials have non-negative coefficients. So OK, so these kajlan lustig polynomials have non-negative coefficients. So he, that's my review of the left-hand column. OK, so if this didn't make sense to you, that's OK. I'm going to start from scratch now. All right. So I'd like to go to an entirely different setting. And I'm going to fill in this column as we go. I'm going to define everything. And there's going to be kind of analogs of all of the things that I described here. All right. So let's go. So along the way, when I described this side, I'm going to get to, to just like here, there was a theorem when W was a vowel group. And then it took a long time to get the corresponding theorem in general. Okay. So on this side, we're going to have some kind of analogous situation where there's going to be a theorem where geometry is around, but there's not yet a theorem in the arbitrary combinatorial setting. And this is what we're working on right now. And there's going to be two theorems like this that are conjectures in the arbitrary situation. So two theorems, respectively conjectures about hyperplane arrangements Respectively, metroids. OK. Uh, yes. Yeah, they are. OK. So let's start with a vector space. And I'm going to start with 
a vector space and a finite collection of hyperplanes inside of it. And I want this collection of hyperplanes to be central and essential, which just means that I want their intersection. So if I intersect all of the hyperplanes in my arrangement, I get the origin. Okay. So definition, a flat is just a subspace that I get by intersecting any of the hyperplanes. Okay, is a subspace of V gotten by intersecting some of the hyperplanes. OK, so I'd like to do an example. OK. So here's an example. I have some vector space v, OK? And I have three hyperplanes intersecting at the origin here, OK? So hyperplane 1, hyperplane 2, hyperplane 3, OK? So by the way, just to fill this in as I go. So here, this is going to be an arbitrary matroid. And a vial group is going to be called a representable or, or realizable matroid. Okay, The analog is going to be a realizable or representable matroid, which I'm going to talk about hyperplane arrangements here. Okay, So hyperplane arrangement. And I'm going to describe to you which post set I'm talking about right here. OK, so I have a bunch of flats I can get by intersecting these hyperplanes. So I'd like to organize the information of all of the subspace that I, subspaces that I get, all the flats that I get in some nice post set. OK, so let's do it. So if I, if I intersect none of them, I get the vector space, the whole vector space. OK. So if I intersect any one of these hyperplanes, I get the hyperplane itself. OK. And as soon as I intersect two of the hyperplanes, I get the origin. All right. And if I intersect three, I still get the origin. OK. So how do I get the, the containments in the post set? I, I order it by reverse inclusion. So this subspace is contained in these, and these are contained in the whole thing. All right? So I get this post set. And this is a ranked post set, and it's ranked by co-dimension. OK, so co-dimension 0, 1, and 2. All right? So the first theorem that I'm going to talk about, theorem slash conjecture, is called the top-heavy conjecture. OK? And it's something to do with the shape of this post set. This is called the lattice of flats, by the way. So if this is an arrangement, I'll write L of A. This is called the lattice of flats of the arrangement. OK. So let me do one more example. So here I had three lines inside of, say, R2. Okay? Now I want to do four planes inside of R3. Okay? Let me not draw the picture. I'll just draw the, the lattice. Okay? So I have the whole vector space. And then I have my four planes. And the planes are contained in the vector space. And now if I intersect any two planes, I get a line. OK? So instead of writing h1 intersect h2, I'll just write h12. OK? So h12, h13, h14, h23, h24, h34. 
So I get six lines, and the containments go like you think they should. Two, four, three, four. OK? And as soon as I intersect um, any more of these planes than two, I get back to the, to the origin, OK? By my condition I wrote down there. OK, so this is what it looks like in this example. And here I can, I can state what this top-heavy conjecture is. OK, so the top-heavy conjecture says the following thing. It says, draw a line through the middle of the post set, like this. OK, start at the bottom, go up some number of levels, but don't cross this line. OK, so start at the bottom, go up some number of levels, don't cross the line. Start at the top, go down the same number of levels then there should be more elements at this level than there, uh, than there is at this level. OK? At a particular um, rank. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. at a particular rank. OK, so let me, let me state this, this theorem. So this is going to be the first theorem or conjecture. So this is called um, the top-heavy conjecture. And um, so this is, a, this is a theorem by Junha and Botong Wang in 2017. And it was, it's conjectured. So it, it's a theorem whenever I have hyperplane arrangements, when I have geometry floating around. Okay? And it's a conjecture for arbitrary matroids. Okay? So it was conjectured for arbitrary matroids by Dowling and Wilson in 74 for arbitrary matrix. OK. So it says just what I said. So for every k less than 1 half the dimension of the vector space, so that's my, my line I'm drawing in the middle, the number of flats of dimension k is greater than or equal to the number of flats of co-dimension k. OK? That's what it says. Good. So now I'd like to continue. I stated for you the first problem. Yeah? So you realize the whole matrix is it over any field? Yeah, so there's a theorem from 1957 by Rado or something that says that if, you're, if your matrix is realizable over some field, then it's realizable over a finite field. And that means that, so in a lot of the things, What's that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so for, for the proofs of all of these theorems, it doesn't matter. It's, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So your examples are R, but you don't care. I don't care. I don't care. That's right. Okay. So I'd like to continue with R polynomial. I'd like to tell you what it is on this side. Okay. So. I'll just use this example. So in this example, I can, I, can, I can write down some polynomial. So here's a definition. And let's now, for this, I just said it doesn't matter. But for this, this is a heuristic definition. Okay, so meaning it's a definition that's easiest to remember, but if you're talking about a general matroid, they have, a, they have an analogous definition that just is plain combinator combinatorial having to do only with this lattice of flats. Okay, so I'm going to give you something geometric, and I'm going to tell you that you can write down something purely combinatorial just for the lattice of flats. So to give you something geometric, I want a vector space over a finite field. And I'm supposed to use Q here, but I'm going to use T because all my polynomials are over T. Okay, so this is the finite field with T elements. The characteristic polynomial of an arrangement is, so what I do is I count points over this finite field of the complement of my hyperplane arrangement. OK? So So I take, I take my hyperplane arrangement, I take the complement of it, and I count points over a finite field. So let's do it in this example. 
So over here. You say over at t. Yeah. It's kind of assumed that it's defined over all at t. So what exactly do you mean? So what I mean is. Defined over the integers, then you say. Yeah, right. So this is why I put this. <laughs> this is why I put quotes. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. To extend the field. You, you, if you want to work geometrically, you can do that. If you want to work combinatorially, you can take the matroid associated to whatever hyperplane arrangement you have. Okay, and then there's a definition in terms of the the Mobius function on this poset. Yeah, so it's called the characteristic polynomial of a poset or a lattice. So there's something purely combinatorial here, and this is just like that combinatorial definition is not easy for me to remember, but this is easy to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Exactly. Yep, it's just inclusion exclusion. And you can see that just in terms of this. That's right. OK, so what is it for this example? So OK, I'm removing the, the thing. The whole plane is t squared many points. I remove the three lines. And then I've subtracted the, the origin too many times, so I have to add it back in twice. OK? OK. You were talking about like look at the Coxeter arrangement yeah, instead. Yeah, what I get, what I get after our No, no. Yeah, it's it's a very funny thing. Like, so I get this question every time that like, okay, so the Coxeter arrangement is a hyperplane arrangement. Um, so, so you could you could write down the Coxeter-Lustig polynomials on this side, yeah. or you could use the Coxeter arrangement and write down whatever the I didn't define them yet, but whatever these polynomials are, Coxeter-Lustig polynomials of matroids, and it's so. These polynomials are not generalizations or specializations of each other, but they're both special cases of something Richard Stanley defined. Um, called, I mean, people call them Kaja and Lucic Stanley polynomials, and there's some, basically, you need a post set with something called a p kernel, and he defined some general framework that pops out a polynomial, and the polynomial, when you start in this framework, is the Kaja and Lucic polynomial here. It's this one here. Yep. I can say more about this later. If you're interested. OK. So I am trying to define the Kajan Lustig polynomial, but the characteristic polynomial is what's playing the role of this R polynomial. And you should remember everywhere here, like I'm doing a hyperplane arrangement, but you, you can use matroids, OK? Arbitrary matroids. Heck algebra, I don't know what it is on this side. None of us know. So uh, that's a question mark still. OK. And I'll get to this in a second. So let me define Kajan Lustig polynomials and matroids. And this is not enlightening at all. I'm going to write down some recursive definition. And if you've seen the thing on the left hand side, it's exactly the same thing. OK. It's the same recursion. Like I said, they're both special cases of some more general theory. OK. So I just need to first say that. Um, if you have a flat, so if I, if I pick a, an element of, of this post set, then there's a way to get um, two new post sets from it. And these are going to be post sets of some hyper related hyperplane arrangements okay? that I, I don't want to define. But if I pick an element, I can take everything above it in the post set, or I can take everything below it in the post set. And these are going to be post sets for other hyperplane arrangements. Okay, so I can get new post sets from old ones. Okay, so if I have one of these, then um, so there are two new arrangements, and their lattice of flats look like this. So these are called localization and contraction. So, so yeah, or use quotient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So I can take everything above or everything below. So this is going to be my guy where I take everything above, and this is the one where I take everything below. Okay. All right. So let me write down a definition now.
So this is a theorem slash definition. So it's a definition. I'm going to tell you what the definition of Kajan Lustig polynomial is. And it's a, it's a theorem that there exists a unique polynomial satisfying this, this definition for each arrangement. So this is due to Elias, Proudfoot, and Wakefield in 2016. OK, so it says there exists a unique way to assign to an arrangement a polynomial I'll call it PA of t. And this polynomial has integer coefficients satisfying the following things. OK. So as I said, if you, if you know this side, it's, it's, it'll look very similar. OK? So if the dimension of the vector space is 0, the polynomial that you get is 1. Okay. If the dimension is positive, then there's a degree bound on the polynomial. So the degree is less than one half the dimension of the vector space. Okay. Um, so I'm going to define it in terms of hyperplane arrangements, but you could easily stick matroid here. So everything I'm saying, I'll tell you when it doesn't make sense anymore, <laughs> right? But everything I'm saying, you can, you can just stick matroid where I say arrangement, OK? And the, the point is that um, this, this last thing I'm going to write, you'll see that, I mean, it has this characteristic polynomial in, in, inside of it. And I, I said you can define this purely in terms of this lattice of flats, which all matroids have, OK? So the third one is that t to the dimension of the vector space times P A T inverse. So it's some nasty recursion. Sum over all the flats in the lattice of flats. So chi A upper F of T, P A lower F of T. Okay. So this is the recursion. All right. So I want to, I mean, this is really like um, not transparent. So I'd like to just show you a few examples, especially in these cases. OK? So here, um, the example is kind of not interesting. The polynomial is 1. OK? Maybe it is interesting. OK, here, the polynomial is 1 plus 2t. So in general, this, the linear term here is the number of coatoms, which is the things one down from the top. So the number of coatoms minus the number of atoms. So it's 6 minus 4 here. Okay. Yeah. Um, for, yeah, for the linear. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting observation, right? Like, the fact that the number of coatoms minus the number of atoms is non-negative, this is, um, I think for the, the linear term, you could, you could really write this out using this recursion, and you could, you could probably prove this. There's an interpretation of all of the other coefficients in terms of multi-indexed flag with numbers or something. And it's um, some plus minus, plus, some alternating thing. And it's just not clear whether the, the expression is non-negative. OK? Good. All right. So where am I? Ah, so the second, the second thing I want to, to say is that, uh, well, the second. Number one was this top-heavy conjecture. And number two is that these coefficients are non-negative. OK? So it's, it's basically this. All right? So I told you the top-heavy conjecture. And 
Number two is the, the non-negativity of the coefficients. So this is a, this is a theorem. And, and the theorem's in the same paper where these polynomials are defined. Okay? And I'll say something about their, their proof, um, the proof of these two theorems when, you have a hyper, when you're in the setting of hyperplane arrangements. Okay? So the theorem is that the, the kaijan lustig polynomials of hyperplane arrangements have not negative coefficients. And I mean, the, the reason is that it has an interpretation just like the thing I erased, but I haven't told you what the Schubert variety of an arrangement is yet. Okay? So it's some uh, intersection cohomology Poincare polynomial of something. Okay? So I'd like to now, I'd like to tell you um, proofs of number one and number two whenever I do have geometry. Okay? This is a conjecture in the matroid case. And this is, this is, so we're working on one and two for arbitrary matroids. That's what we're doing right now. So that's, that's the joint work up here. OK, so maybe I could say, remember there was this result of, of Polo that said in this setting, most polynomials were kajdan lustig polynomials. OK? So in, in this paper by Elias Proudfoot and Wakefield where, where they define these polynomials, and in some subsequent papers, they make a series of conjectures about what these polynomials look like just by doing a bunch of computer examples, running tons of examples. And the conjecture um, is that the polynomials you get on this side are, are real rooted, which is very strong. Okay. So real rooted implies that the coefficients are log concave, which together with like non-negativity implies that the coefficients are unimodal. They go up and down. There should be no internal zeros. Meaning what I'm trying to say is that these are very special polynomials. This is a contrast to this case. OK. So now to, to talk about these two proofs, I'd like to tell you what what the analog of Schubert variety is. OK. And maybe I'll refer to these examples again. OK. So for hyperplane arrangements. Okay. And this, uh, this real rootedness is that mm -hmm. so that's still open in the hyperplane case even. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really a conjecture. Yeah. I think so there are some classes of matroids where this is known. Um, so I think uniform matroids up to some rank, I think they, it was done purely combinatorially. And, and I think um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's some list of authors who I can't remember the name. It's, it's a very recent paper. Um, they're, all, they're all in China. I, I don't know who these people are. But yeah, so they, they proved that uniform up to rank, I don't know, 12, 15, something like that are real rooted. And also, they proved that a bunch of matroids that are graphic matroids, like the ones coming from graphs, like fans, wheels, whirls, these sorts of things, are, are real rooted. Okay. But it's in general, it's, it's very open. OK. So I wanted to find the Schubert variety. So I have a vector space. Yeah. Do you have any reason why um, this should be real rooted? Um, no. I mean, other than. Tons and tons and tons of examples. Just turning them out with, by computer. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. No, there's just computer evidence, and and some examples have been proven. Yeah. Some classes. Okay. So I have this vector space, and what I can do is I I can consider the quotient map, where I quotient by one of these hyperplanes. Okay, and if I take the sum of all of these for every hyperplane that I have, then this thing is an injection 
the kernel is the origin, okay? By that condition that I wrote down, the intersection of the hyperplanes is, is the origin. And now what I can do is say, well, this is a hyperplane, so this is all, these are all affine lines, okay? Okay. And now what I'm going to do is compactify each one of these by adding a point at infinity. Okay. So this sits inside of a product of P1s, one for every hyperplane. So the definition of the, the Schubert variety of an arrangement is the following. The Schubert variety. Call it y sub a. It's the closure of my vector space inside this product of P1s. Okay. Good. So the Schubert variety is very nice. So one of the things um, that happens on this side. Um, so, so the flag variety has a stratification by affine spaces, okay? So that's one of the things we also have here. These the, the Schubert varieties are stratified by affine spaces, okay? So let me write this. Maybe everybody know what the top heavy conjecture says? <laughs> If I erase it, okay. Okay, so y a has a stratification by affine spaces. And these affine spaces, I mean, these strata are labeled by the elements of the lattice of flats of the poset. Okay. So just to give you, I'll just kind of give you an idea of what the, what these these guys are. Okay. So these these strata are defined as, I mean, basically you look at the flat, and then this flat tells you which coordinates set to to set to infinity and which coordinates to to be not infinity. Okay, so that's how these strata are defined. And I'll just give you some example. So if I take the, the bottom element, the whole vector space, what I get is the point at infinity. Okay, so I get this point. And if I take the top, all the way at the top, I get the vector space that I began with, okay? So basically, uh, I'll just draw a picture here. So in a, in a neighborhood of the origin, I look like the original vector space in a neighborhood of the origin. So like now I'm back in this example. And in a neighborhood of the most singular point, I look like a cone. So this is zero, 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 and here, infinity, infinity. Okay. So I want to tell you two consequences of having a stratification by affine spaces that are essential to the proof of these two theorems, okay? So a stratification by affines gives you the following two things. So we have a cell decomposition, so we know something about the, the dimension of the cohomology of my Schubert variety, okay? Sure. Isn't that, I mean, like, uh, from 
Major Focal Major Variety, Super Variety also like defined for the every single element. Of Perfect. Variety. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. In fact, I mean, like they're right. So. The, uh, I think another question that's equivalent is like, you define Kajan loosely polynomials on this side by a pair of elements, by an interval in the post set. And here I define one for the whole matroid or arrangement. Okay, so here's the fact that makes this column special. So over here, it's not true that if I take an interval in a Bruja post set, then that is the Bruja post set of some other Coxeter group. That's not true. But here, it is true that if I take an interval of a lattice of flats of a matroid, then that is the lattice of flats of some other matroid. So there are operations on matroids that say take, take, say, take everything above, and there's another operation that says take everything below, and if I do both of these, I get the interval. So I can get away with just talking about all of these things for one matroid or one arrangement rather than for an interval. Okay. Did that answer your question? Okay. So the dimension of this is the number of flats of co-dimension k. So it's, it's the number of elements of my post set at, at level k. All right. And the next one, um, I didn't know about this before I started working on this, this project, but it's, it's a very useful seeming thing. So there's a theorem by, by Bjorner and Ekedal in 2009 that says, um, the so there's a natural map in sheaves um, that gives you this map on cohomology. Okay, so this is a map from like the constant sheaf to the IC sheaf. Okay, so this natural map is an injection. Whenever I have a stratification by affine spaces, this is some purity argument. This is a paper called "On the Shape of Bruja Intervals." But it doesn't have anything to do with Bruja intervals. It just, I mean, it works more generally when you have a stratification by affine spaces. So cohomology embeds inside intersection cohomology. Okay, so I'm ready to give you a proof of the first statement. Okay, left all my erasers here. OK. So proof of the top heavy conjecture. Again, this is due to Jun He and Bo Tong Wang in 2017. OK. So it's basically these two facts. And the, and the hard left shed's theorem. OK, so let me just tell you the, the outline. So I want to show some number is, is bigger than some other number. OK, so the, the number, of, number of elements at, at this level is a dimension of some, co some piece of the cohomology. And the number of, of, of elements at this level is a dimension of some piece of the cohomology. So I want an injection from this degree in cohomology to, to the next degree in cohomology. OK? So this is, this is the hard left shed's theorem, except that we have to use the hard left shed's theorem for, for intersection cohomology instead of cohomology because the Schubert variety is not smooth. Okay. So let's take an apple class. So if k is less than or equal to 1 half the dimension of my vector space, then I have the following setup. OK, so I have intersection cohomology here. And I have another degree of intersection cohomology here. And I've dropped the y sub a, OK? It's just y. So y is y sub a. And the, the hard left shed's theorem says that if I multiply the right number of times, uh, so dimension of v minus 2k, by this ample class, I'll get an isomorphism. OK, so that's the hard left shed's theorem for intersection cohomology. Now this injection that I have, this bjorner ekedal injection, says that cohomology injects inside intersection cohomology. OK, so, so this is Bjorn Reck et al.
This is Murek et al. So I can restrict this map to one here. And if I have two isomorphisms, I mean, two, uh, I have an isomorphism in two injections, then that means that this is an injection. OK? So that's it. So this is the top heavy conjecture. So this implies top heavy. OK? For the arrangements. Uh, this is just because you have a cell decomposition. Yeah, yeah. OK. So good. All right. And number two is that, um, well, the Kajan and Lustig polynomials have some interpretation in terms of intersection cohomology of these Schubert varieties. OK? So I'll just write this down. Just to be quick, I, I'll shorten it. OK, so it's some point gray polynomial associated to the intersection cohomology of this thing. So it's dimensions of something, so the coefficients are non-negative. OK. So in the last, what's that? OK, um, maybe, so OK. So the way that you have to prove this, that's what you have to do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm suppressing details. But really, the, the proof of this is you have to use l adic cohomology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're right. Yes, absolutely. In the case of cash, the, uh, the, the left hand side of mm -hmm. our polynomials also have a smooth application. Uh, is that the case here with the classical polynomials? Um, interpretation how? What do you mean? Um, on the left hand side? Yeah. yeah. There are polynomials like counting points over finite fields of Richardson varieties, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I probably it's the same, but I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Good question. OK, so now I want to just say in the last 10 minutes a few words about like what could you hope to do if there is no geometry involved, if you try to prove these two theorems. OK. So now, conjectures one and two for arbitrary matroids. OK. So the first thing I want to claim is that everything makes sense so far. I mean, the statements of conjectures one and two make sense for arbitrary matroids. OK. So I, I haven't defined what matroids are, and I, I won't. but um, the point is that matroids come with a lattice of flats, okay? So they come with some post set, and this post set has a rank function, okay? So there's a post set, and there's a rank function. So since there's a post set, you could ask about the number of elements at various levels. So you can state the top heavy conjecture. And you can define Kajdan and Lustig polynomials of matroids because this characteristic polynomial makes sense for arbitrary lat for, for these lattice of flats, okay? So it's defined purely in terms of the post set. So you can make a polynomial. So if maybe this is this is uh, not transparent. So so if maybe another way to write this is um, so it's the dimin so if I take intersection cohomology of a Schubert variety, then I can take the stock at the most singular point, the infinity 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 point. Uh -huh. Okay. So so take the dimension of the intersection cohomology of a Schubert variety, but local intersection cohomology at the most singular point. Uh -huh. 
then the dimensions of, of those are going to be the coefficients. Okay, so it's the same, it's an analogous theorem to the, the left-hand column, if you write the correct um, definition for Schubert variety. Okay, so that chronologically, the important thing is that it only has cohomology in even degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important, yep, yep. Okay, so, so these, these make sense. These make sense for arbitrary matroids. Okay. But there's an obstacle that there's no geometry. So the obstacle is no geometry, meaning we can't define the Schubert variety of an arrangement because there's no arrangement. Okay, so we need combinatorial replacements for for these two guys. Okay, if we want to copy, if we want to write down to, like copy the proof and write down some commutative diagram like this, we need combinatorial replacements for these two guys. Okay. Okay, good. So, um, because I'm running low on time, I'll just tell you some things, okay? So, this, this cohomology of Y here, so you can define a ring purely in terms of generators and relations, and these generators and relations only come from this lattice of flats. Okay, and if you're familiar with the, ter the, the literature, if you've heard this word before, there's something called the graded Mobius algebra of a post set. Okay, and, and that's, that's this. Okay? So there's a theorem. And this is also in this paper by He and Wang in 2017 that says that. Um, this cohomology of Y has a presentation in terms of just this post set. Okay? And the thing that you get is called the graded Mobius algebra of the post set. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a ring that you can define when you don't have geometry floating around. And when the matroid is realizable, when it comes from a hyperplane arrangement, it's isomorphic to this cohomology. Okay? And now we're kind of at a difficult spot because um, I don't think it's very hopeful to find generators and relations for intersection cohomology of this. I mean, at least we don't know how to. Okay, so you can, you can write down this in terms of generators and relations, but what do you do here? Okay. So this is our program. by all of the people written up there. So this Y, this Schubert variety is, is a singular variety. It's a singular projective variety. So I can write down some, I mean, we can write down a resolution of this, okay? So there's a resolution. And this resolution is gotten by a sequence of blow-ups, okay? So, so you first, you blow up the point, which is the stratum corresponding to the bottom element of the post set, okay? And then you, you blow up proper transforms of the strata corresponding to the next level, and then the proper transforms of the, the strata corresponding to the next level, and you keep doing this, okay?
OK, you keep, keep doing this. Go up in the post set. OK? And there's a theorem that now the cohomology of this also has an interpretation in terms of generators and relations. OK? So this is basically, I mean, we realize this, but it's basically worked by Feigner and Yusvinsky and De Concini Prochesi. There's like this, these wonderful compactifications. OK? So, um, as a purely combinatorial presentation. Okay. Uh, so I don't. I think it. I think it depends, but it doesn't depend within a rank, like within a level of the post set. Ah, oh, you mean like the bots Samuelson resolution in the right? So no, it's a, It doesn't depend on a reduced expression of of an element or something like this. It it, it there's one resolution for this. Okay, no yes, choices. yes, that's right. No choices. Yeah. So it's unlike the bots Samuelson case in this. Okay. So good. So like I said, um, it's likely unlikely to to find a presentation of this. So I think I'll talk for three or four minutes. Is that okay? OK, so geometrically, we have the following situation. So we have the cohomology of y inside the intersection cohomology of y. This is this bjorner ekadal injection. OK, and this is inside the, the cohomology of the resolution. OK. so. And to, instead of doing generators and relations to try to, to try to describe this, we have combinatorial presentations for these two. So what I could try to do is I could try to decompose this ring as a module over this ring and find some nice uh, direct sum end that, that is this one. OK? So this is what we, we try to do. And um, just to, so I won't have time to like, you know, say much. So. We do have the right, the right definition. It's, it's one of those things that, well, I'll say something afterwards. You can define it in many different ways. And there's some big in, inductive argument to try to prove hard left shets, point gray duality, Hadriemann bi bilinear relations for this, this guy. And depending on how you define it, like you can define it as the thing that makes sense, but then it's not, the definition is not good enough to get you anywhere. Right? So you have to define it in some complicated way to be able to try to do some induction. Okay? So the goal is to decompose. Now, I mean, everything here is the, the thing that makes sense for an arbitrary matroid, even though I'm writing this. Okay? As a module over the cohomology of y. And Find a nice submodule, which I'll call I, satisfying so if I want to copy this argument, I need some kind of injection like this, right? I need to, I mean, first find some left shets element, like state combinatorially what hard left shets should mean, right? And get an isomorphism like this. So I'll just write hard left shets. So these, these two together, would imply the top-heavy conjecture for arbitrary matroids by using the same exact argument. Okay. And the third one is that I want to, so I, I could put M here, but just for consistency, I've been using the arrangement everywhere. But this should be some Poincaré polynomial. Okay. 
So I'm out of time, but if you're curious about where we are in this whole program, you can ask me. Okay, so thanks.